say a warm welcome to all of you this morning and a warm welcome to Dr. Jenny Goodman, who is going to be uh, the person we're interviewing today, an expert on staying alive in toxic times. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi. Hi, I'm fine. Great to see you, Ramina. Great to see you too. So a few words uh, about uh, Dr. Jenny Goodman. I actually uh, came across her book when I attended one of my own events on the toxic brain. And it was interesting to see that uh, when I got hold of her book and, and you know, the, the book read Staying Alive in Toxic Times, I was quite intrigued to see a few chapters there that were talking about quite different areas that we need to look at when looking at toxins from um, chronic diseases like aging, dementia, autoimmune disease, preconception care, um, seasonal foods. I was quite intrigued and I started reading her book and that's when I contacted Dr. Goodman and said, let's do a little interview on understanding why she wrote this book. Um, what is so uh, interesting about toxicology in terms of the different toxins we're exposed to and how can we prevent that? So I would um, dive right in and ask her the first question. But before I do, I just wanted to introduce you uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Jenny Goodman. So as you can understand, the word doctor means, uh, the acronym doctor means that she's not just a medical doctor, but she's also has a postgraduate degree in environmental and nutrition uh, medicine. So a very interesting field that is growing as, as you know. And also, I will be uh, asking her a couple of questions because I have read the book, but please feel free to ask questions as well. And I'm more than happy to, to ask them directly for you, or you, we can unmute you and we can uh, ask the questions directly to Jenny. So my first question to you, Jenny, is what actually inspired you to write the book? I mean, when I read the introduction, um, I was quite fascinated to read that, you know, back in 1976, when you were in medical school, you asked yourself these three questions that actually excited you to attend medical school. And the three questions are, um, what causes illness? How can we prevent illness? And the most interesting question of all, how can we heal these diseases? And I think you were quite excited when you joined medical school, hoping to, to be able to uh, to get the answers for these questions. Mm. Yes, um, and that's exactly what I thought I would be learning. Uh, and long story short, that's not what it's about at medical school. It's about making a diagnosis, which means, which means giving a label to the illness. It doesn't turn out to mean what it means in Greek. Diagnosis means knowing through and through. Um, but actually, we were taught to find a label for an illness. And then once we have the correct label, we would find the correct drug. OK, long story short, because you all know what's wrong with conventional medicine. It was many, many years before I found a group of doctors who were doing precisely the kind of medicine that I'd gone to medical school to learn. And that was the British Society for Ecological Medicine. Some of you will have already heard Dr. Sarah Myhill, a longstanding member talking so she's part of that too and um, what they were doing was asking those questions and finding answers um, because actually how do we heal the sick is interesting and important but to me far more profound and more urgent are the questions what's causing all these illnesses and therefore how can we prevent them and uh, I was in a room full of um, about 50 people shortly before lockdown and I asked them to raise their hands if they knew anybody who had cancer. And every single hand in the room went up. Now, if we were to rewind 50, 60, 70 years and ask the same question of an equivalent group of people, it'd be one or two or maybe three hands. So in other words, COVID is not our only epidemic. We have a pandemic of dementia and cancer and diabetes, heart disease and so on, and autoimmunity and autism. We know this, but it isn't conventional medicine that's asking the screamingly obvious question, which is why. And when the prevalence of a disease changes so rapidly in one or two generations, it cannot be very much to do with genetics at all. Genetic predisposition must be a fraction, a 5% at most. Therefore, we're looking at environmental and nutritional factors, changes in the way we live, in the air we breathe, in the water we drink, and the food we eat, 
and the soil that it's grown on. So that's why I'm looking now at the nutritional factors, people's diet, their micronutrients, not just what they eat, when they eat it, how they eat it, where it was grown, whether it's been sprayed with pesticides, whether the animal's been fed antibiotics and hormones, um, and looking at the pollution that is all around us, not only in the air and the water and the food that we have relatively little control over, but also in the personal care products that so many of us, especially women, have been using on our bodies, um, completely blissfully unaware that they're full of all sorts of nasty toxins. So I, I conclude the introduction of my book by saying, if you're going shopping, whether you're going to the chemist or the supermarket, or even sadly the health food shop, take your magnifying glass, because some of these nasties are even added to the cheaper supplements. And I was very shocked when I discovered that. I was too. I mean, we, even as, as practitioners, you know that we spend a lot of time looking at these supplements, making sure that, you know, they don't have the, the toxins before recommending them to clients. Mm. And um, speaking of supplements, I know that there was a, a big section in your book that talks about um, supplementing or not supplementing. And of course, we all know as practitioners that because of, you know, agricultural excesses, we are to supplement. Um, but when we're looking at a chronic disease, we are, you know, supplementing or recommending supplementation for clients mm. but how long do we take these supplements right. and you, you know about the supplement debate is how long do we take it do we actually need it in the long term right. are there any adverse effects from taking them long term yeah for some of them there are and for some of them there are not so the first thing is to take the vitamins and divide them into the fat soluble fat soluble and the water soluble and you will know that all the b vitamins except possibly b12 and all of vitamin c is completely water soluble and that means you need some every single day you cannot store it in the body whereas if you look at vitamins a and d and e and k they're fat soluble that means you can store them so you need some sometimes but you don't need them every day now what is absolutely fascinating about that is that if you think about our hunter-gatherer ancestors in the stone age they would have had foods containing the B vitamins and vitamin C every day because that was the gathering half of hunter gathering. You'd find berries and nuts and seeds and grains and fruits and little plants. So you'd get your vitamin C and your B vitamins every day. However, when you are hunting, you're only catching an animal maybe once every few weeks. And given that they ate the whole animal, not just the muscle meat, the whole lot, you know, the liver, the kidneys, the heart, the brain, the glands, the full works, they would have got their supplies of vitamins A and D and E and K, and that would have lasted them for, you know, many, many weeks. So that's the vitamins. In regard to the minerals, they can all theoretically be stored. Um, and therefore, theoretically, you can overdose on any of them. But the one I find nobody's ever got enough of is magnesium, because we lose it when we're stressed. We pee it out an evolutionary glitch we don't understand. Uh, so I would say vitamin B, vitamin C, magnesium and probiotics, but changing the probiotic regularly if you need a probiotic, those are safe to take on a daily basis. Everything else is now and then. And ideally, of course, you would test from time to time. You'd do a blood test to see if you need it. So I find lots of women with menopausal problems and fertility problems and so on, and men with fertility problems as well, desperately low in vitamin E. And I will give the full dose for six months, and then that's probably all they need. For many, many years, they don't need it again. So long as they're eating nuts, seeds, lettuce, eggs, avocados, you know, the food can be your maintenance for a vitamin once you've topped up. But if you start off very deficient, you won't catch up. So for example, the most important neglected mineral is iodine. You know, if someone's desperately low in iodine, they can eat fish and seaweed till it's coming out of their ears. They won't catch up. You give them the supplement for six months and then the food is enough for maintenance. And of course, food was all we needed until the time of the industrial revolution because all our food was organically grown, it was fresh mm -hmm. and uh, we picked it and we ate it when it was in season and now we're getting food that's been you know flown all the way across the world contributing to air pollution and climate change 
it's not fresh it may not be organic it may have insecticides and goodness knows what on it and the toxicity in the environment and the stress of our lives mean that we use those nutrients up much more quickly so for example your vitamin c is depleted by smoking drinking tea coffee paracetamol so the government's recommended daily intakes i'm sure you know are complete nonsense um, and, and sometimes if somebody has a toxic metal on board, let's say nickel, which is a very common industrial pollutant, um, or cadmium from cigarette smoke or too much use of yellow paint, um, or mercury from their fillings, whatever, all these things push the zinc out. So you give someone zinc, you give them more zinc, you retest a year later, they've still got no more zinc. That tells you there's a toxic metal on board competing. And the same if somebody's iodine just refuses to normalize despite supplementation, it means there's another element in group seven of the periodic table like chlorine or bromine or fluoride, which is competing with the iodine. So chlorine from the tap water, unless you filter it, uh, fluoride from the tap water in the West Midlands and certain other parts of the UK, but also now in toothpaste and dental floss from the dentist without telling you. So it's complicated. It is, it is. But it's interesting to know and remind ourselves that some of these uh, toxic minerals actually compete with the minerals that we are ingesting on a daily basis and or depleting them. So I think yeah. it's a very good reminder. One of, the, um, yeah, one of the great teachers and mentors of the British Society for Ecological Medicine is Dr. John McLaren Howard. And he, whenever he lectures, he would say, a toxic metal or any pollutant actually is an anti-nutrient it's an anti-nutrient so it is really a battle between putting in the good stuff which is the nutrients and taking out the bad stuff which are the toxins and it's pretty important for people's health to put the good stuff in before you take the bad stuff out so you know if i'm if i'm taking somebody off an antidepressant medication for example i won't even begin to lower the dose until they've got really good levels of the B vitamins and vitamin D and the omega 3s and the omega 6s, you know, the essential fatty acids, magnesium, zinc, and so on. Once you've put the good stuff in, it is easier and less problematic to withdraw from the toxin, whether that's, you know, a psychotropic drug or metal in the teeth. That's really, really interesting. Um, and we all know supplementation is such a big debate, but I think as long as you're uh, aware of, of all of this, including, as you said, the water soluble vitamins, mm -hmm. etc. What about seasonality, uh, Jenny? Because I know that even supplementation or even foods, as you put it on your book, there's a whole chapter on mm -hmm. seasonal eating and uh, seasonal supplementation as well. well. In fact, um, there are four chapters, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And for each chapter, I describe what foods are in season and good to eat, what foods are out of season and don't touch them because if they're in the shops, they've come from the Southern Hemisphere, uh, what nutrients you might be lacking, but also the health hazards of particular seasons, which are not necessarily nutritional. So for example, in autumn, come September, the mold count goes up very high. And people who are sensitive to mold, particularly asthmatics or people with arthritis, can react very strongly to that. And I describe exactly what you can do about that. Um, obviously, hay fever in spring and just about everything infectious in winter. Um, so essentially, um, in the winter chapter, I'm describing needing almost every supplement under the sun. Masses of vitamin C, obviously vitamin D because there's no sunshine, um, magnesium, zinc, selenium, which is brilliant for the immune system as well. So you know all that, and that applies to late autumn, winter, and early spring. However, the book was published in January, late January, so two months before the world changed out of all recognition. And I now already need to revise what I've said, because what I've said there is once it gets to late spring and summer, and there's masses of wonderful green vegetables and berries and sunshine, you shouldn't, unless you're ill and under the care of a nutritional therapist for a particular reason, you shouldn't need any supplements at all through late spring, summer and early autumn. However, COVID has changed that. And the antiviral measures, which I describe on page 67 of my book, 
um, which Dr. Sarah Myhill describes in great detail, de detail um, in her book, Infection, The Infection Game. Um, all those things which I said only really apply to winter, I think we need to keep doing some of them now. Certainly, we need to keep taking vitamin C, I would say. At the moment, I'm taking two grams at breakfast and two grams at dinner. Um, but there's a whole lot in the back of my book on page 305 about how to build up your vitamin C dose really carefully so you find the right dose for you. And I think we need to be doing that long term because this virus ain't going anywhere. Vitamin D is more complicated. We've had a lot of sun. And if you can get out there and roll your sleeves up, wear shorts and get plenty of sun on your skin, um, then you don't need to be taking that until late October. But if it's a very rainy day and it's cloudy, then I would say take some, take it in the evening. Okay. But in terms of, so that you don't waste the sunshine you've had during the day, because if you take it in the morning, your blood levels high, you won't turn your cholesterol into vitamin D, even in the sunshine. But the other thing about seasonality, which isn't going to change even with global warming is to do with light, right? We need sunlight, not only to make vitamin D in our skin, we also need it for the pineal gland in the brain. And the brain knows it's daylight when it's daylight. Okay, so we keep the lights on, particularly the screen lights with their blue that looks like the sky and their white that has the blue in it. We keep that screen on till late at night. We're not gonna sleep. And so, you know, our natural rhythm really is to hibernate in the winter when there's hardly any lights, only daylight for a few hours. We need to, we need to definitely get out and about during those few hours so we get some sunlight but then we need to you know to really hibernate hibernum means winter in latin and contrastingly in the summer um, we need to be out and about outdoors which is why the lockdown has been such torment for so many people so if the pineal gland gets its daylight in the daytime and it gets dark in the evening it will make melatonin and you will sleep no. So, so seasonality is about those rhythms. It is not just about nutrition. Um, and you know, I think I said somewhere in the book, if you've got to get up at five in the morning for work, that is not a problem in June. It's a very serious problem in December and we shouldn't be doing it if we have any choice in the matter. Absolutely, and I think it's quite an, in, an interesting introduction on seasonality, even explaining to our clients. Mm. Why do we have seasonal foods? Why do we have supplementations? Yeah. When I read the book, I did find that it was such an easy read that it's actually okay. something I would recommend a client to, yeah. to take it up if I just wanted to introduce them a little bit to toxins, well, uh, depending the, on the conditions they have. Yes. I think one of the main reasons for writing the book was you know, I've been doing this kind of medicine for 20 years and you do find yourself saying the same thing over and over again. And you think, you know, I'm spending a whole hour giving this information to one person. And I, I've always taught in adult education, actually, even before I knew about nutritional medicine, because I feel very strongly about demystifying this psycho, you know, scientific and medical knowledge and getting it out there to people. It's really not rocket science. It's science. It's biochemistry, but it's not rocket science. And it is about democratizing medicine, medicine and medical science so that everybody can know. So it's about getting the word out there, but it's also for nutritional therapists to make the job much easier because if the client reads it and they come to see you, you will hit the ground running. They will know exactly why you're suggesting what you're suggesting and they'll understand this way of thinking, which is essentially put the good stuff in, take the bad stuff out. So we, we need to talk about the bad stuff. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. And and talking about the bad stuff, mm -hmm. I think um, I I really enjoyed reading the bits in your chapter where, even in regards to fertility and preconception care, um, obviously you talk about pollutants and all of that, not just um, affecting, you know, the 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 delivery or the pregnancy, but also affecting the health of the baby. And you yeah. further on go to talk very deeply about electromagnetic. Uh, radiation mm -hmm. and all of that and and the effect of that so I think I'm quite interested to understand in terms of preconception care if you could okay. dip a little bit into that okay so at, at any age the good nutrients do us good and the toxins do us harm but the harm is mostly by the effects on our DNA 
And when cells are rapidly dividing, that's when that effect is most profound and potentially damaging in the case of toxins. So the younger you are, the more vulnerable you are, both to chemical toxicity and to radiation, whether that's X-rays, gamma rays, or the kind of radio frequency waves given off by Wi-Fi and mobile phones. So the most vulnerable of all is the egg and the sperm, the single cell. Just tell your patients not to put the mobile phone in their pockets. Uh, mostly at some point during your consultation, you will notice that somebody takes their phone out of the pocket to answer a call and says, oh, sorry, I forgot to turn it off. That's your moment to say, just don't ever keep it in your pocket unless it's switched off, off, off. Um, what happens um, when the egg and the sperm meet and form an embryo is you've got cells dividing at an extraordinarily rapid rate. And that becomes a, an embryo, which becomes a fetus, and it gets its entire blood supply from the mother. Now, the placenta is a conduit. It is not designed as a filter because nature didn't anticipate there would be anything harmful ever coming in. So everything in the mother's body and the mother's bloodstream is regarded, if you like, in quotes, as food. So it all goes through the good, the bad, and the ugly. So really both men and women need to start preparing ideally a year before they want to conceive making sure that they're applying all the principles you know anyway eating the good stuff not eating the sugar not eating the artificial additives eating their greens eating organic so that the egg and sperm which will go to form that baby are not going to be contaminated with insecticides herbicides you know antibiotics and all that many other toxins and I list all the sources of them in, in chapter seven of my book and I also list ways to detoxify. So there are six or seven ways that people can use to get those things out of their system and ideally you want to have done that process and completed it before you start trying to conceive. Now it's not an ideal world but that's something to work towards. Absolutely and that's one of the reasons Jenny I wanted to uh, plan a webinar with you as we discussed before Mm -hmm. on preconception care so that you can take us through these seven steps this process and yeah. give us a guideline for us to take away for ourselves or for our clients or any family members that we sure. should see sure and i think it's it's a very important part especially this summer that we are able to have this information firsthand from you so i will be um sharing more about that webinar a little bit later on but let's dive into some of the questions uh Dr. Goodman, that have come up. Sure. So, uh, Emma, thank you. You say um, for the for your question. So you so she's saying we don't. You said we don't need to supplement vitamin D during summer, as long as we get enough sun. But mm. what about people with darker skin in this country during summer? Yep. Okay. Thank you for that question. It is the single most important question at this moment in history, because we all know that um, people of African and Indian origin have been dying disproportionately in this epidemic. And there is not enough sunshine, even in the summer, for anybody in this country, but particularly not if your skin is darker. And the darker your skin, the more melanin you've got, the more sunshine you need to make enough vitamin D. And it is not only that vitamin D supports the immune system to fight viruses, it is that vitamin D also tones down the immune system and stops it going into the cytokine storm, the inflammatory explosion, which is actually what has killed most of the people who've died in intensive care from COVID. So I'm really glad you've raised this. I feel very passionately, I want to get the word out there somehow to the BAME community in this country that they need vitamin D supplements probably every day of the year, but we're testing. This is the point. I mean, the NHS can test vitamin D. It knows how to do it. And I think we need to be going to our GPs and demanding that test. So let's talk about what's an acceptable level because the normal range I work with is 75 to, to 200 nanomoles per litre. Check the units because some surgeries use different units. But the NHS may tell you it's fine if it comes back at 50 because about half of all GP surgeries have lowered their normal range. So instead of saying 75 to 200, they say 50 to 150. Now that's very important. They've moved the goalposts for the same reasons they've moved it for the acceptable level of thyroid hormone thyroxine. 
because they've been finding so many people with lower levels that instead of concluding we have an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency, which we have, they have instead concluded that they must have set their normal range too low. And that's a classic example of conflating what is healthy with what is average. Okay, so yes, you know, if your skin is any shade darker than mine, you go and insist on a vitamin D test. And I would say, frankly, if it's below 100, take a supplement, take 2000 IUs every evening. It is important, I think, evening, not morning, um, and take it through the winter. And, you know, take it in this situation in the summer as well. But not if it's been a really blazing hot day and you have actually been sunbathing, because for any color skin, that will do it. But thank you. That's very important. And if anybody wants to come back to you, Ramina, with suggestions for how we can get the word out to those communities afflicted by this, I would be really happy to help do that. Feel free. I will definitely let you know if anyone has any ideas. I think as a, as a community ourselves in nutrition, we need to be together in this and yeah. support each other absolutely yeah um, there's another question uh sorry going back to uh the vitamin d mm -hmm. um you mentioned to take it in the evening uh could mm -hmm. you remind us why you said yeah. that you said okay. well, two, two reasons yes. two reasons uh, one it's better absorbed and it goes well with magnesium which you should also be taking in the evening for muscle relaxation and sleep but two we know that how the sunshine makes vitamin d in our skin is by converting the cholesterol to vitamin D. But if you've just taken your vitamin D supplement at breakfast, and then you go out in the sunshine, the body will read a very high blood level of vitamin D. So it won't think it needs to make any more. And you want obviously more of your vitamin D made from sunshine than by supplements. You know, that's the natural way to do it. So, so that's why. That's, thank you for that. That was very insightful. Um, you mentioned, uh, Jenny, that in your book you plan to revise it because of um, COVID. And, uh, and uh, if we wanted to buy the book now, you know, um, if you plan to revise it, how soon would that be? No, no I, didn't, I didn't say I plan to revise the book. I don't think the publishers will do that. Um, I just meant I have to revise what I'm saying. Um, and it very simply is that what only applied to winter in the book some of it you need to particularly the vitamin c you need to and, and zinc and iodine you need to carry on all the way through um, because the way we protect ourselves against this virus is twofold one is you know all the stuff the government said about avoiding contamination avoiding infection from other people but the other crucial thing is to strengthen our own immune defenses and that is essentially vitamin c vitamin d zinc Selenium, but not too much. You can overdose on selenium. And most neglected and important, iodine. Absolutely. Iodine is, is the hidden one. Uh, Rachel is asking, uh, what is the book called and where can I buy it? Um, okay. I'll let you answer that, Jenny. It's uh, called Staying Alive in Toxic Times, A Seasonal Guide to Lifelong Health. And it's published by Hodder and Stoughton specifically by the yellow kite imprint of Hodder and Stoughton. You can get it from Waterstones, from Amazon, although I say that with some reluctance, but there are other online bookstores like Wordery and Beehive, or is it Beehive? Yeah, no, The Hive. The Hive, the Hive Wordery, Waterstones, Amazon, or from the publishers. Yeah, it's very easy to get hold of. Thank you. I, I did get mine from Amazon, <laughs> Dr. Goodman. So I will forgive um, you. Yes, you gave me one, but I, I got it on Kindle as well. I, I wanted the Kindle version. Oh, also it's available as an audio book for anybody who can't see well to read. Thank you. Um, in, in one of your sections, you talk about um, the disease of aging and the importance of yeah. looking at... Um, some diseases that we call the diseases of aging, such as dementia, Parkinson's. What, what is your view on all that? Okay, so I feel strongly about this. Okay, if you read 19th century novels, they're full of very old people who are completely healthy in their mind. They may be a bit frail and weak and walk with a stick, but they've got all their marbles there. Okay, so this is 
very, very new. The disease that Alzheimer described, he called pre-senile dementia. And his first case history was a woman of 51, 51, okay? So it's not normal or natural or inevitable for us to lose our brain power as we age. Um, and there are reasons for it. Um, but first of all, I just need to refute the classic argument that, that um, the authorities use, which says, oh, we're living so much longer because of the marvelous benefits of modern medicine. We're living long enough to get all these hideous diseases. Well, there's a flawed logic there. Secondly, if we look at these diseases like heart disease, like cancer, and even dementia, they are increasing much faster among younger people than they are among older people, right? There are people now with dementia in their 40s and 50s and in some very, very polluted cities, even children are being diagnosed actually with Alzheimer's, okay? So um, people with diabetes, now there are 11 year olds with diabetes, so-called mature onset type two diabetes in Bradford, they found a bunch of 11 year olds with it. Um, and any toxins that damage the DNA, again, will disproportionately affect the young. So if somebody's in their mid 90s and they can't remember their next door neighbor's name, it's not a problem. But if they're in their 40s, that's a serious problem. Um, so there's a case history of dementia in the book, which was actually very successfully, well, stopped at the level it was at. You know, we didn't get brain power back, but we stopped further deterioration. And, you know, my colleagues also have several cases like that. And we found several factors combined in this relatively young person, I think she was 55. At first, she had very low vitamin D indeed, almost in her boots. She just didn't eat fish. She didn't like fish and she didn't get any sunshine and she was dark skinned. So that was one factor. Second factor, she'd been on low fat diets all her life trying to lose weight. So she didn't have any of the fat soluble vitamins like A, E, K or D in her brain. And she also didn't have any omega threes on board that the brain needs. Third, she worked in a very, very polluted place and we found her levels of all sorts of um, toxins very high. Specifically, we found aluminium, very high levels of aluminium. As you know, you know from Dr. Professor Christopher Exley, aluminium in the brain is a major cause of dementia. Um, so are other heavy metals like nickel and cadmium. Pesticides and mercury we know are involved in Parkinson's disease. Multiple sclerosis, I've never had a patient who didn't have a mouthful of mercury and a sky high level of it and low vitamin D. See, disease is multifactorial. Mm -hmm. Anything serious enough to kill you, you're not going to find one cause. You're going to find half a dozen, which is why we have to think holistically and tackle this from every angle. Absolutely. I think that's a very, very important point that disease is multifactorial. Yeah. Um, and I love this case study you've just described on, on this person with um, neurodegenerative conditions. Yeah. Um, just to say quickly, um, Emma says, thank you. The book is fabulous. My new Bible. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank um, you, Emma. <laughs> and um, Gareth is asking the, this question, how would you measure iodine levels okay what are the reference and optimal ranges any difficulties with blood testing accuracy okay i don't blood test i urine test for iodine um and that actually has been available throughout the lockdown because you don't have to go and have your veins punctured um biolab do a simple urine test for iodine levels uh, but what you want to ask for is not just the iodine concentration because that's affected by the concentration of the sample you ask for urine, cre uh, sorry, urine iodine creatinine ratio. So you're wanting the iodine to creatinine ratio that takes out the variable of how concentrated the sample is. They give you a normal range. They say that it's most accurate if you do a 24 hour urine collection, which is a bit of a faff. I don't always do that, but if you want to be certain, you can. The only foods that contain significant amounts of iodine are white fish, and seaweed. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, you don't eat fish, for goodness sake, you know, eat the seaweed. Make your own sushi, but eat the seaweed. And I think um, iodine deficiency is very common. So it's not just because we don't eat it, it's because the chlorine in our tap water, if we don't filter our tap water, uh, pushes the iodine out. And so do all the horrible dental products with fluoride in. Now, there are people who think we should be on a very high dose of iodine. Dr. Sarah Myhill certainly does. Um, and Roderick Lane, the naturopath, gives people 
phenomenal doses. What Sarah Myhill quite rightly points out is it is toxic to all viruses, fungi, bacteria. It's the most brilliant antiseptic we've got, and they still use it in operating theatre. So, you know, if you're in um, an enclosed space and you're worried about catching COVID, COVID, you mix your iodine with some coconut oil, make an ointment, smear it on your nose and mouth. If the virus can't get through that, it will be yellow, but, you know. <laughs> I, I actually have my whole tub of coconut oil mixed with iodine ever since uh -huh. Dr. Sarah Milehill mentioned it. Right. It's a very powerful tool, absolutely. But we also have to ask ourselves why, given that, you know, iodine kills viruses, vitamin C kills viruses, stone dead, zinc, selenium, vitamin D, they're so important, they're so harmless. Why is it so hard to get this information out to the wider world? Because it is. Many of my colleagues have tried. Um, Damien Downing, president of the BSEM, wrote to The Lancet several times about vitamin D, citing countless published peer-reviewed papers. They wouldn't publish it. I think we know why. It's, we, know, we know why. It's, it's you really can't patent a natural it's a challenge we're experiencing here in the UK, to be honest. Yeah. I had several uh, American integrative doctors telling me, we find it shocking that in the UK it's so difficult to, to get your voice heard when all of us as within the industry are fighting about all of this in the US and the UK it seems like it's a bigger challenge. So. so the more you teach your patients about this, the more the word gets out at a grassroots level. And you know, um, I'm sure Sarah said this, but the word doctor means teacher in Latin. It's, it's all absolutely. we have to do. Thank you. Um, another question for you. Uh, what is the best test for toxic heavy metals? Okay. This is a difficult one. There is no ideal test. And I will talk about tests, but first I must say that my main source of information is not testing. My main source of information is a very detailed environmental history. Okay, so I ask, where have you lived? Were you near any kind of mine or factory? What did your mum do? What did your dad do? Did they come home with these things on their overalls? Was your mother a dental nurse? Um, have you eaten lots of margarine because that's got nickel in it? Have you worked in any industry where particular metals were a hazard? So you can find out by taking the history. If you grew up with parents smoking, you have cadmium toxicity, no doubt about it, um, and so on. Uh, when you actually try to test, um, I think the best one we've got is the MELISA test, which is done in Central Europe, and it's looking at how your lymphocytes react to particular heavy metals. If you've become sensitized to them, you must have had an excess amount of them on board. And that can be arranged through Biolab. They don't do it, but they send it to Europe where the MELISA test is done. Great Plains Laboratory have got more and more useful toxicological tests. And Biolab do do a urine heavy metals. They do. Um, but there is no precise test. And the problem is that um, if you take heavy metal on board, particularly little and often chronic toxicity, the body's very sensible. It's not going to leave it hanging around in the bloodstream. It's going to try and store it away and it'll put it in the liver and the kidneys and the brain where, yes, it will do damage, but it's not circulating. So you go to somewhere like Guy's Hospital Toxicity Centre, their toxicology centre, they just take a blood sample and they won't find it in the blood because the body doesn't leave it there. Unless you've just bitten a thermometer, you won't have mercury in your bloodstream. Um, so blood tests are not particularly useful. Urine tests are more useful. And some people say we should use provocation. So you take something like chlorella or zinc, which will push, for example, the mercury out of the body or silica and loads of vitamin C, which will push aluminium out um, and lead and so on. But we've all got these things in our system. So there is no perfect way of testing. So use testing, but take it with a pinch of sodium chloride. What's more important is, is the person ill? And are they getting better with the detox measures that I detail at the end of chapter seven? Um, because there's nobody on planet Earth who hasn't been exposed to this stuff. It's hard to figure out how much. I used to use Acumen Laboratories all the time, run by John McLaren Howard, but he has just retired. So, you know, it's every kind of test you can do and using your environmental history that you've asked the person about.
That's very, very interesting to know. Thank you for that. The only way you can know the actual body burden is by biopsying the liver and you're not going to do that. <laughs> that's, that's very, very aggressive to do, yes, uh, harsh. Um, but yes, I, I agree. We can use specific um, strategies, like you said, to detoxify and then start measuring according to the symptoms of the client and see how they're feeling. So I think that's a good way of measuring that as well remembering that you know you do put the good stuff in before you try and take the bad stuff out so you know i do describe several detoxification methods like organic vegetable juicing saunas which is difficult to do at the moment colonic hydrotherapy very difficult to do at the moment epsom salts bars sprouting your own um seedlings on the windowsill and watering them with water that's got zinc in so they'll incorporate it and so on very high dose vitamin C and, and a few other things. But before you do any of that, you make sure that all the nutrients are at tip top level. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, do you recommend fl fluoride free dental products? Yeah, absolutely. They actually make a difference. Yeah, they do. And in the book, I have, um, I have mentioned um, quite a few actual brands of fluoride free toothpaste. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In, in chapter seven, there are a few brands of fluoride free toothpaste that I specifically mentioned. But the other thing you have to do is to say to your dentist, particularly if you're, um, if you're taking your children to the dentist, please do not put any fluoride containing products on my child's teeth. They don't even know sometimes the dentist what's got fluoride in and what hasn't. You have to get them to look at the ingredients list on their package inserts. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, if um, you look at the, the graphs of the decline in tooth decay in European countries, it's been going down steadily since the 60s because people have been brushing their teeth better. Where they've introduced fluoride into the water, it's made no difference to the tooth decay rate. It hasn't declined any faster. And the countries where they have fluoride in the water, their tooth decay rates aren't any better than the ones where they don't have. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, Jenny, going back to the question on iodine, Garrett's saying um, dry, you know, um, dry blood spot tests um, mostly show uh, heavy metal toxicity as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know what's okay. your response to that, but um, not something that I've used. Okay, but yeah, um, Garrett, iodine. I I, which ones? So can I just add something for Gareth, which is um, one of the most useful substances for detoxing heavy metals is iodine. It works very well. So in terms of uh, dosages, how much would you, would you give for that, for example? Oh, more than it says on the pot. I mean, I, I would say probably 12.5 milligrams of something like iodoral, which is a mixture of iodine and iodide, maybe four times a week, but not forever, you know, just for a few months. Then you keep going with eating seaweed. Um, but again, it, it depends on your baseline and where you're, where you're starting from. But it is important to point out that some organs in the body require iodine and some require iodide. And that's why we need both. Lugol's iodine contains both and so does iodoral. So would you give, you would put a few drops and, and uh, drink it orally? Or? Probably, one, probably one drop, but you can put eight drops on the skin. That's the equivalent. It okay. stains the skin yellow. If that yellow patch disappears within an hour, you're seriously deficient because the body's sucking it in. Um, if it stays till the next day, you've got enough iodine on board. That's a rough and ready test if you can't afford the urine test. Well, that's a great test to do. I'm going to try it immediately today. So, <laughs> And is, is iodine safe to give to children? Um, yeah, but in relatively smaller doses, of course. Somebody has asked if I can spell the iodine of choice. So it's either Lugol's iodine, that's capital L, U, G, O, L, apostrophe S, iodine, or iodoral, which is I, O, D, O, R, A, L. You can get it from the natural dispensary. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, we are reaching an end, and I know there's, uh, we, I hope we've answered all the questions, but it's been extremely interesting to understand the reasoning behind your book, some of the chapters, and I would recommend everybody to uh, read it and to uh, recommend it to their clients, absolutely. And um, I also wanted to share that uh, we are actually doing a webinar with 
with Dr. Jenny Goodman on preconception care and beyond making healthy babies. And this is following my uh, chat with her when I got quite interested to understand, you know, a year before uh, conception or a year before a couple would like to conceive, you know, what are the tools, what are the processes and what are the, the tips that uh, Dr. Jenny Goodman can give us for that. And then as well as understanding during the pregnancy and after the pregnancy in terms of breastfeeding, all of those uh, different tips and techniques that we could use to really support ourselves, support our clients if we're looking to support them with fertility. So please do join us on the 30th of July. So at the end of this month, um, as you all know, uh, the Nutrition Collective also hosts a series of other events. So there's something happening this Saturday on our self-growth series on building, uh, uh, working with any kind of blocks, resistances that we have with our own emotions when uh, consulting with a client. So looking at ourselves and seeing what is blocking us from having a good uh, client outcome. And sometimes it's about looking at ourselves. And Dr. Amit Agarwal is not just a, a naturopathic doctor, but he has uh, worked with psychotherapy, dissolved therapy, and all sorts of other therapies. So uh, a great person to chat with. Um, we also have in, uh, in a couple of weeks, an amazing masterclass with Dr. Mimi Guarneri, who is a cardiologist. And I think a lot of you know, uh, Robert Burkirk, who is uh, the director for the Alliance for Natural Health. And actually, Jenny, he's one of the people that's really supporting our industry to really fight for uh, making sure that uh, the government and uh, the media are aware of all the nutrition and the supplements that we are uh, using and the effectiveness of it during COVID. So uh, please do join us for, for any of these webinars and masterclasses. But I'm very excited to uh, host the webinar with you, Jenny, on preconception care and beyond making healthy babies. I think it's exciting times to understand some of the processes, toxins, uh, ele electromagnetic radiation can play on fertility. Um, and again, if uh, any of you want her book, the book is called um, Staying Alive in Toxic Times, a seasonal guide uh, to, to health. Lifelong health. To lifelong health. To lifelong health.